Good morning and a very happy Sabbath to each one of you. We want to welcome you for our song service this morning. For our first song, let's all sing 249, 249, praise him, praise him. song will be hymn number 361 361 hark is the shepherd's voice
song will be hymn number 526, 5 to 6, Because He Lives. Good morning and a happy Sabbath to all of you who, are, uh, who have joined with us this morning to worship with us. And um, this week I had an experience I really want to share and thank God for his uh, blessings that he has given me. The past week I had a severe headache, a migraine headache, and the doctor thought I was having a hemorrhage and he was very scared. But thank God it was only a migraine headache and that continued from then on slowly to this past week. And this week I have a very bad sinus infection. Yesterday I almost took the exit to go to the Washington Adventist Hospital ER to get checked out. But then I prayed to God and I told God, I have these responsibilities in the church today to do the flowers and tomorrow I have to take part in the church. So if you make me feel better, I will serve you for the rest of my life. And I want to thank God and praise him for this blessing that he has given me, for making it possible for me to stand here this morning and worship him. I want to thank all of you who are watching us online. We welcome you. And we hope that this Sabbath blessings will be upon each and every one of you as you worship with us today. For our opening song, let's all um, turn our hymnals to hymn number 341, God be, To God Be the Glory. 341, To God Be the Glory.
Happy Sabbath, church. Scripture reading this morning is taken from Psalm 89, verses 1, 2, and 8. Psalm 89, verses 1, 2, and 8. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall build up shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? Or to thy faithfulness round about thee? May the Lord bless the scripture just read. Let's pray. Our most gracious, kind, loving, living Heavenly Father, all praise, glory, honor belongs to your dear, holy, and righteous name. Father in heaven, we come into your presence with a humbled heart, seeking your love, your grace, your mercy and kindness upon each one of us. Lord, we know we have nothing good in us, and so we come as we are for cleansing, O Lord. Cleanse us with the righteous blood of Jesus. Create a new and clean heart in us and renew a right spirit. Lord in heaven, we want to thank you for taking care of us through the past week and showing us this beautiful Sabbath morning. Thank you for bringing us once again into your house of worship too. Sing praises and glorify your name. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless the program that is prepared for this day. Be with all the ladies of the church as they serve you, as they bring messages to, uh, through your word, O oh Lord. We pray that you'll touch them and may each heart be touched and may each heart receive your message. May we learn to walk with Christ. All these blessings and mercies we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. I have a question for you all. Um, what's your favorite fruit? Well, my favorite fruit or fruits are strawberries, watermelon, and mangoes. Now, I know everybody, just like myself, was so sad when, is always sad when mango season ends, but it'll be around next year. Well, did you know that God loves fruit, too? And he created that the fruit that we have. He likes apples, strawberries, raspberries, grapes, bananas, plums, peaches, lemons, and limes. He likes all the fruit. And God created all the fruit. But did you know which is his favorite fruit? Well, God's favorite fruit is Christians. Now, that's strange, right? How can God's favorite fruit be Christians? But that's what God wants to see. Christians bearing fruit. You're not going to grow apples on your hands, and you're not going to grow grapes on your legs, but you're going to grow fruit. And what kind of fruit does God want to see you bear? Bad fruit? No, good fruit. You're God's favorite fruit. And let's think for a minute what kind of fruit he wants to see you bear. Um, apples, because apples grow. Um, how about banana tree? But don't banana trees grow bananas? They do. And apple trees bear apples, lemon trees bear lemons, lime trees bear limes, and the list goes on. So what kind of fruit do Christians bear? You see, when you tell others about Jesus Christ, how he came on this world, how he died for you, how he forgives you, and how he loves you, that's how you bear your fruits. Christians bear other Christians. But you've got to share that with Jesus. Share that with everybody else and make them a part of that tree, the Christian tree. Think about it and talk about it with everyone on how God has called us to be fruitful Christians. Thank you.
the meaning of the Kannada song is based upon um, the Bible verse in Psalms 121. Happy Sabbath again to all of you, and I'm so glad to be doing the mission story today because it comes from the state that I am, Karnataka, and the city that I grew up in, Bangalore. How bless, what a blessing it is to be speaking about a church that needs help today. Sandeep and Ramya had just finished their health seminar in a public school, and one of the teachers pulled over to them and said, my mother-in-law is suffering from a serious back problem. Would you mind meeting her? Sandeep and Ramya went to meet the mother-in-law. Her name is Shubangi. And this was their first health um, treatment that they were going to give, give after their uh, medical training and health seminar. They hoped to do better <clears throat> based on the Bible and Ellen White's writing. 
The couple found the um, mother-in-law, Shibangi, in bed. She had spent a lot of money on treatments, but nothing had helped. Now she was bedridden, unable to stand or walk, and was living alone. Her son and daughter-in-law could not take care of her anymore because she was in a lot of pain and they had moved out. Sandeep and Ramya met her and they, when they went to her house, they tried to talk to her and she told them what was going on and she showed them all the medic medications that she was taking and she had too many medications to take. This was their first time doing this missionary after their training. So they looked at each other not knowing what to do. Sandeep took the medication from her and he reviewed it and he decided that they were going to ask her to stop taking all the medications for one week. And he asked her, would you mind stopping, stop taking all these medications for one week and let's see how you feel. And she agreed. <clears throat> the treatments began. Ramya gave her hydrotherapy and massage in the morning and evening and she gave her vegetable juice for meals. On the third day, praise God that Shubangi was able to stand up and walk for the first time in months. She was so happy and tears flowed down her, her eyes. My son and daughter-in-law have left me to die. They don't take care of me anymore because of my illness, she said. Sandeep advised her to just pray and God will take care of it. Now, Shubangi was not a Christian. She was living in a place where even if someone saw anyone walking with a Bible in their hand, they would make a big noise. So she was afraid, but nevertheless, she did not give up. She decided to read the Bible every day, and they had asked her to read only one page, but she decided to read three times, morning, afternoon, and evening. She read one page all three times. And after five days of treatment, praise God, she was able to stand up and walk with no more pain. She was completely well. Ten days later, she called Sandeep. She said, son, you told me to read the Bible every day and pray, and my son and his wife and the uh, grandson would return back. But it has been ten days, and they haven't come home yet. Sandeep learned that she had been reading three pages, and he advised her, to keep praying and that they will come. Three days later, the couple received a text message from daughter-in-law, her name is Aisha. She wrote, I am now living with my mother-in-law in her house. The family was reunited. Today, the mother-in-law reads the Bible regularly and she sends Sandeep and Ramya verses from the Bible. She was so encouraged and she kept encouraging Sandeep and Ramya, I'm not sure if you can see it, but that is Sandeep, Ramya, and their son, Ayush. She was their first patient. Sandeep says, we did not know how to deal with this. The medical training only gave us the basic principles. Somehow God led us, and it is a miracle. Praise God. <clears throat> Part of this 13th Sabbath offering will help construct two churches in Bengaluru. This is the Sevanagar Church, this is a Tamil Sevanagar church, and that is the Kannada Central Church, which, which I attended when I started working in Bangalore. And I am so happy to be bringing this mission story today. And it is my earnest plea that you will give willingly to help build these churches so that many more can come and worship in the churches and learn about God and spread his love to everyone. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, Church. This morning, we are going to sing a Telugu song, which is from the state of Andhra, located at the southern part of India. The meaning of the song is, I always praise you, God, for your countless blessing. All living creatures from earth to heaven, including creatures in the forest, crawl on the ground, praise you. May you all be blessed as we sing this song. Thank you. 
Dear Lord, as we continue to worship you in spirit and truth, accept our worship and honor and glory that goes all to you and you alone, Jesus. 
Forgive us of our sins and accept our worship this morning. Lord, as we continue to worship you, soften our hearts, open our minds that we may accept your words and walk accordingly, Lord. I want to thank you so much for the assurance that your eyes are always watching over us, over the good and evil, and I thank you for that. Help us, Lord, as we study your lesson now. Help us to understand your point of view on how to live our lives. Help us to study daily your word so we can get, be educated with what you want us to know and to live accordingly. Again, Father, please forgive us of our sins and accept our worship. Bless Audrey as she teaches us the lesson. Put your words in her mouth and let your Holy Spirit lead her so that we will grasp what you want us to learn and may, may we live according to your will. I pray this in Jesus' mighty and awesome name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, and welcome to the lesson study. I'm sure we have been enjoying this quarter's lesson on the topic of education. And this week, we have studied the eyes of the Lord, the biblical worldview. I'm sure it was interesting, it's been an interesting study as we are going to review it this morning. Let us bow our heads and pray before we get into the word. Most kind and heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for bringing us here at this time as we're about to go into the studying of your word. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will tabernacle here at this time. Use me, speak through me, Father, and be with everyone that is, is tuning, that's listening, that is studying in their various uh, Sabbath school class. I pray that your word is clear and that it will bring a change in our lives. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The memory text coming from Proverbs 15.3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Sister White said in the SDA Bible Commentary, nothing can happen in any part of the universe without the knowledge of him who is omnipresent. Every act, every word, Every thought is as distinctly marked as though there were only one person in the whole world and the attention of heaven were centered on him. Patriarchs and Prophet 218. And there's also accountability. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the thing done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. You know, this memory verse reminds me of another verse in Psalms 139, 7 to 8, and I'm sure we all are familiar with it when I was um, looking on some of the, the classes reviewing the study, they often refer to this verse. And it says, Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into the heavens, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 
God is indeed everywhere. There is no place where man may flee from his presence. All those who are securing him though, here is a beautiful promise. God has given abundant assurance in his word that he is ever present. Jesus says, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismay, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And then in the final crisis, God's people will be able to say, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. As we look at the topic, the eyes of the Lord, the biblical view, first let us examine the word worldview. As human beings, we never look at the world from a natural position. We see it always and only through filters that impacts how we interpret and understand the world around us. That filter is called a world view. From the various areas of our lives, jobs, families, social interaction, personal reflection and world's affairs, we settle on a core number of principles that we hold as true. These principles are broad in scope and usually touch on issues of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Our worldview affect the way we act and treat others as well as our decisions. Take, for example, the worldview of creation. How did it all begin? Where did man originate? For almost 2,000 years, many of the world's smartest and best educated people thought the world simply sat immobile in the center of the universe. Many believe the earth is flat. As for the earth's beginning, there are theories such as the Big Bang Theory. The universe began as a very hot, small, dense superforce, which is the mixture of four fundamental forces with no stars, atoms, forms, or structure called a singularity. Then it inflated over the next 13 plus billion years to the, co to the cosmos that we know today. Then there's the passing star theory. It is believed that the Earth was born when a star passed very near the sun. The star had a high gravitational pull and hence attracted some material from the sun. I tell you, just reading this, just make my mind <laughs> just, just want to explode. <laughs> then we have the origin of man, um, which you have the most widely accepted theory, which is Darwin theory of evolution, that all species of organism arise and develop through the natural selection of small inherited variation that increase the individual's ability to complete, survive, and reproduce. This theory is widely accepted and taught in our schools and universities. In the absence of a biblical worldview, which is based on God existence, and that he is a personal God who interacts with his creation, so much of what we think about our world can be so completely wrong. So why does worldview matter? Worldview that stray away from biblical witness can easily 
undermine human value. And when you undermine human value, dark stains are left on the pages of history that trickle down to this present time, such as the atrocity of the Holocaust, which kills so many millions and millions of Jews. You had slavery, a dark stain of slavery, ethnic cleansing, human trafficking, social injustice, which is filling our news today, the abuse of, of any kind, this basically stemmed from the undermine of human value. The eyes of the Lord in Sunday's lesson. So what is the nature of reality? There are two possible views. First, is that the universe and all that is in it, including us, just is. Nothing created it, nothing formed it, it's just there. There is no God, there are no gods, there is nothing divine. Reality is purely material, purely natural. There is only atoms and the void. Neil Bohr, a prominent Danish physicist, best known for his explanation of the emission spectrum of hydrogen, hydrogen atom, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Born in Copenhagen in 1885 to well-known educated parents, Bohr became interested in physics at a young age. He had a dislike for all religion that claimed to base their teaching on revelations. The idea of a personal God is foreign to me, he says. Stephen Hawkins, probably the most renowned genius of the modern age, who contributed to the understanding of the Big Bang and black holes. He said in 2011, we are each free to believe what we want, and it is my view that the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created the universe, and no one directed our faith. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. We have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe. And for that, I am extremely grateful. The second viewpoint is that some divine being created the universe. That indeed seems more logical, that the idea that this universe just is, with no explanation for it, does not really make much sense. Psalms 51.3 declares, the fool has set, set in his heart, there is no God. The word of God makes it clear, God exists. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. A just God, a savior, there is none beside me. Isaiah 45, 21. Central to any Christian education is the reality, not just of God, but of the kind of God that he is, a God of goodness 
as well of as well as greatness of love as well as wisdom of mercy as well as justice of compassion as well as power a personal god who loves us and who interacts with us first john 4 8 states that god is love and no greater demonstration than that which was recorded in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me pause here for a moment. Here we see the great God of the universe he knew what Jesus was going to go through, the rejection, the rebuke, to see his son spat upon, to see the, 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 the ordeal of the, the cross, his trial, all of that abuse, and yet, knowing what was going to happen, he still basically gave his son his only begotten son, that you and I might have everlasting life. This is what Satan wants to take away from us, that everlasting life. He does not want us to inherit that at all. He is also a God of miracles who, through using natural laws, is not bound by those laws and who can transcend those laws when he will, such as the virgin birth of Jesus. 1 John 14 tells us, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one, the only son, who came from the father full of of grace and truth. On Monday's lesson, <clears throat> it talks about a German thinker who posed a question that asked, why is there something instead of nothing? There are many questions that people have questions regarding our past, our present, and our future. Now all of this, when you want to know about a subject, what you do, you study that subject. You go to a book that will inform you about that subject. By inspiration of God, we are given the answer to the question regarding our origin and the more questions in the Bible. There is no book like the Bible. As an educating power, the Bible has no equal. Nothing so broadens the vision, strengthen the mind, elevate the thoughts, and ennoble the affection as does, as does the study of the truths of revelation. The Bible, the word of God, begins with God and ends with God. All the contents is related to him. It gives us insight into what God is and what our relationship to him should be. The Bible was given to us for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope Romans 15, 4. Two, the question that was posed, why is there something instead of nothing? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hebrews eleven three. The Bible makes it clear in its opening word in the first book of the Bible, 
Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the earth. And all through the word of God, you will find verses after verses confirming that God is the creator. Let's examine a few of those verses. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. Isaiah 45, 12. Thou, even thou, O Lord alone, says Nehemiah, thou hast made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the sea and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all. First John 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All these things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the architect and designer of everything, animate and inanimate, from Genesis to Revelation, the answer is clear. How long did it take to, for God to perform each mighty miracle? As long as it took to speak the word. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Psalms 33, 9. Following each day, God said, it was good. It was good. And then it was very good. To say that it took millions of years to bring about the evolution of the world or the creatures upon it puts an unmerited limitation upon God's power. He can use time if he so please, or he can dispense with it altogether. In regards to the origin of man, there is no grounds for belief that man was evolved by low degree of development from the lower form of animal or plant life. Man did not come from some slime pit taught by evolution, but from the hands of a loving God, completely mature, bearing in his, his image, and had the mind of God. Man was the crowning creation act of God's creation. Though from the dust, Adam was the son of God. Satan's goal is to destroy faith in the Bible. He is trying to move God out of the equation with these man-made theories, which all are based on chance. But why did God take six days to create the world? The full story is told in the second chapter of Genesis. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Thus, God formed the weekly cycle not for the benefit, but for the benefit, not for his benefit, but for the benefit of man. Mark 2.27 states, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Because he cared so much for the two wonderful creatures he made, he planned that every seventh day throughout their lives should be a dedicated day. Each Sabbath was to be for them a day devoted to thinking about him, free from life's regular duties. They were to walk and talk with him and meditate upon his goodness and love. 
It was a wonderful plan to keep man forever linked to God. It is important to note that God blessed the seventh day Sabbath and hallowed it, sanctified it, set it apart. This day is a memorial of the six day creation. This blessing was not placed on another day. The world widely accept the first day of the week as the Lord's day, which has no biblical foundation. God warned us that an earthly power shall arise and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. That's Daniel 7.25. We are talking about beginnings. Now I challenge you, those who are tuning in that are not familiar um, with why the, the, the Sabbath is so important. So I challenge you, to study the history of how Sunday began and see what you discovered and then study the subject of the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, and sure, a blessing is in store for you. We must firmly adhere to the teaching of the Bible for this is God reveals truth to humans, explaining for many things about how our world that we would otherwise not know or understand. Hence, all Christian education must be rooted and grounded in the word of God, and any teaching contrary to it must be rejected. Tuesday's lesson, the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview view includes a series of doctrine that teaches us how to live, how to make moral decisions, how to treat our neighbors, how to interpret the world around us, what to expect from the future. Therefore, Christian education must be based on the Bible. The Bible alone shines light on the darkness that has engulfed the world on our, in our troubled time. Many are wondering what is going on in the world which is in turmoil at the moment. Men's heart are failing them for fear. But the prophecy of the Bible foretold the condition which would develop in our world society just before Jesus' return. There will be sign in the religious world, false Christ deceiving many. Signs in the political world. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Signs in the natural world famines and pestilence, such as COVID-19, and earthquake, fire, floods in diverse places. I want to read um, just this article I saw in CNN um, that in the, entitled, the UN warned that the world risks becoming uninhabitable hell for millions unless leaders take um, climate action. But there was a note here that says, between 2000 and 2019, there were 7,348 major national disasters, including earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes that claim 1.23 million lives, affecting 4.2 billion people and resulting in 2.97 trillion in glo global economical losses. Now, that is according to the UN Office of Disaster Risk. So we see all of these things, and people are taking note. We have signs in the economical world, financial foundations all over the world is collapsing. Signs in the social world, this recording in 2 Timothy 3.1.5 reads like today's newspaper. This, all, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy without natural affection, truce breakers, 
false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despise of those that are good, traitors, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. The troubles of an aging creation are described as the sharp pain and anguish of birth, of birth, which in turn will issue forth the coming of Christ. This ex and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. Is there hope? There is a hymn that comes to mind in the um, church hymnal, hymn number 214. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone in part faced in the promise of his word. Soon the heaven will open wide, Christ will come and claim his bride. All the universe will sing, hallelujah, Christ is king. Yes, there is hope, and it's anchored in Jesus. John 14, 1, 2, 3, John 14, um, 1 through 3 tells us, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house or many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. According to his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Formal, former things shall not be remembered nor come to mind. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. They shall, there shall not be no more curse. Jesus will dwell with his people and be their God. And the saints shall reign forever and ever with Jesus. Within the, within the pages of the Bible, you will find strength and hope. That is why the devil is putting his best effort to keep us from reading it, because he know the truth. If you know the truth, it will set you free. Also note from Genesis to Revelation, with every truth God has established, the devil has a counterfeit, and he wants to keep us in darkness. You your only assurance is to stay in the word. It's our only safeguard. Wednesday calls us in that lesson to worship the Redeemer. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. In the account of the temptation of Jesus by the devil, one of those temptations dealt with worship. Matthew 4, 8 to 10. Again the, again, the devil taking him up into an exceedingly high mountain and show him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto them, and said unto him, sorry, all of these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall thou serve. Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt serve God alone. The duty to worship God is based on the fact that he is the creator, and that to him all other beings own, owe their existence, and what Whenever in the Bible his claim to reverence and worship above the gods of the heathen is presented, is presented, there is cited the evidence of his creative power. Basically what it is saying, where you see where, where the Lord is talking about reverence and worship, it is shown that he is creator. Let's look at a few of those texts. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, 
for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were created. Revelation 4.11. Isaiah 45.18 and 22. For thus saith the Lord that created the heaven, God himself that formed the earth and made it, had established it. He created not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that have made us, and not we ourselves. So the everlasting gospel calls go out to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people with a loud voice in these last days saying, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the spring of waters. Let's go to Thursday's lesson. I see time is getting away, so I will not go over. So um, in Thursday's lesson, which deals with the law of God, <clears throat> As you travel the world, you will see at times that different, in different countries have variation in their laws about the moral behavior of their citizens. These laws can be modified or removed altogether. The penalty, penalty also depends on the degree of offense. However, the Bible introduced the absolute, unchangeable, eternal, binding moral law that applies to all human beings, the law of God. And the penalty for breaking its law is death. This made the plan of redemption necessary. These laws, become familiar with them, know them, memorize them, apply them to your lives. These laws basically tells us to have no other gods before him, to shun idolatry, to be reverent in all manners, not to use his name in vain, to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. This is a holy day to God. We ought to be respectful of our parents. We ought to value the lives of others and our own. We ought to be pure in our thoughts and action, avoiding the very appearance of evil. We ought to be honest in all our relationship with our fellow men. We ought to be truthful at all times and and under all circumstances, we are to be contented with what God is giving us. Be, <clears throat> Satan claims that God's law is restrictive and narrow, convincing a third of the angel it was necess not necessary to obey them. God, God wanted that God wanted to take away our freedom. Let us remember that the law of God, the law of God, is a trans of his character. It is holy, just, and good. Let us cling true to that true education, which is based in the word of God. Let us pray. Most kind and heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time that you have spent in your word. I pray that your word um, will forever be that, that, that basis, that true education that will lead us and guide us, especially in this troubled time. It's my prayer in Jesus' name, amen.